So I'm going to um, invite us now to, to open our hearts and our minds to God and all that he might want to be saying to us this morning. In a minute we'll have John come up and, um, and preach God's word to us, but I'm really pleased that Sarah is going to come up and, and lead us in prayer. with hope. We pray to God who created us, to Jesus who saved us, and to the Spirit who moves within and among us to grow as a deeper trust and hope. So let us pray. Almighty God, we come in faith to worship and glorify you. We thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you for the life that you have given us. And we thank you for this world, for its majesty and beauty. We praise and honour you, Father of all. Jesus, Lord and Saviour, we worship and glorify you. We thank you for the cross, for rescuing us from our sin and shame. We thank you for the invitation feast together as honoured guests at your table. Mm. And we thank you for your word to us, words of life and love and hope and power. Mm. We praise and honour you, bread of life. Holy Spirit, revealer of truth and breath of life, we worship and glorify you. We thank you for turning our hearts back to our Father God. We thank you for the faith which you have nurtured within us. And we thank you for revealing Jesus to us, enabling us to live, move and flow within the rhythms of his Father's kingdom. We praise and honour you, bring of joy and peace. <coughs> Holy God, Father, Son, and Spirit, forgive us when we have forgotten to trust you. Forgive us when we have placed our faith in the things of this world. Forgive us when we have failed to put our belief into action. <coughs> forgive us when we have neglected to speak of the hope you give us. Thank you, Father, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and set free. Thank you for our communion with you and with each other. As we seek to build a community <coughs> rooted together in faith and love and hope, help us to walk ever more closely with you day by day, we pray. As we hear your word to us this morning, give us receptive minds and spirits. May the power of your spirit equip us to live faithful lives which honour the gospel so that we will overflow with joy and with peace, living as your light in the world. For your name's sake. Amen. 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 John, come on down. <coughs> so welcome John, John Casey. I think most of you will know John. Um, I'm going to let him speak for himself. Um, but John and Leslie have been linked with us ever since they slowly moved tables at the cafe to get closer and closer to a bunch of people that they felt were surely Christians. Um, and it was a joy, I think, for those people then, and then ever since, when we've met with them on, on Thursdays, and I know you've been coming to different things, so it's just wonderful to welcome you this morning. So we, should we just pray for John? Let's pray for him. Father, we thank you that you work in each one of us 
to help us grow closer to you, deeper in our understanding and knowledge and awareness of your presence. And so we thank you for those who come week by week to share your word with us. And we pray that you would work mightily through John this morning and that his words would strike chords in all our hearts, minds and spirits and that you would be with him. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as Kat says, I'm John Casey, and that's my wife, Leslie, over there. Mm-hmm. And she'll be helping me later on, so that's why I'm naming her up. Um, as Kat said, we, we met uh, some of you ladies in Lindor Square and in the cafe, which was great. And it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, And it, was, it provided a uh, real fellowship for us because we didn't really know anybody. In, in Horsham or Southwater for that matter. So it's been a real source of friendship and fellowship and we're really grateful for that. So thank you. So this morning uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of, about what God has done in my life so far. There's still more to come. Um, and I'm going to try and answer one of the big questions in life. Why are some people Christians and others not? But first, let's start, as we always should, with a prayer. Father God, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for the fellowship of everyone here today. Thank you for your amazing gifts of faith and grace. Thank you for all the different ways you speak to us, through your word and scripture, through other people, through visions and dreams. All the ways you're actively pursuing us, to enter into a relationship with you, Mm. to become more holy like you. We welcome your Holy Spirit here this morning. Anoint each and every one of us. Renew and increase our faith and help us to have a fresh love and hunger for you. We pray this service will honour you and bring glory to your name. In the precious name of Jesus, your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Okay, a little bit of my background, just to set the scene. I was raised as a, an Irish Catholic in a place called Hamble in West London. Um, we went to church every week. Um, it was called Mass for the Catholics. Um, however, as the service then was in Latin, I didn't understand a word of it. I'm not even sure the priest did. But the incense was good. Now, being an Irish Catholic, there was really only one rule for us, which was, you can do whatever you like, as long as you don't enjoy it. (laughs) At Mass, we would stand, sit, and stand again until the hour was up, and then the place was empty within two minutes. I remember when I was about 13, just before a Sunday Mass, and I was laughing for some reason. And this woman said, shh, you're not here to enjoy yourself. <laughs> and I thought, well, if that's what God's like, he's not for me. After that, I stopped going to church for a long time. What I didn't realize at 13 was that people always don't always speak on God's behalf. Mm. You should leave that to God. And remember, the tongue is a fierce weapon, so use it wisely. Mm. Fast forward 17 years. I'm married to Leslie and living in Aylesbury, and have two wonderful children, Jenna and Paul, who are pretty big now. <laughs> I was busy carrying out the, uh, carving out a career in IT and traveling the world, the Middle East, Africa, Central and Eastern Europe. And Leslie was working hard too, raising our two wonderful children. And she did a great job. But then, Leslie turned a bit funny. Even more funny than usual. (laughs) She found a dog, she said. And it always sounds a bit strange when people say they found a dog. Was he hiding? (laughs) Was he lost? Anyway, she started going to our local church in Aylesbury. So every Sunday, off she went with the children, and I stayed in bed, enjoying the peace. Jenna, our eldest, had already been baptised 
and Leslie then wanted Paul to be baptised as well. The vicar at the time, Roger, wanted to speak to both of us before he'd baptised Paul. So we agreed, reluctantly. <laughs> the day of the vicar's visit was looming, but I was ready for him. After all, I was a Catholic. I had some knowledge of God, none of the Bible, but it shouldn't be a problem, I thought. The day I arrived and Roger came to have a chat, as vicars do. He was fine, he talked about God, his love for us, God's, not Roger's. Yeah, not both. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 it all sounded very good. I said, look Roger, don't worry, I know all that. I believe in God, I was a Catholic, you know. Incense, though. And Roger said, that's great, John, but do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. I said, what do you mean exactly? What do I need to be saved from? Roger smiled, as vicars do, and explained that it wasn't enough just to believe in God. Even the devil does that. You can't just believe in God and then put him to one side and get on with your life in whatever way you choose, because that's not a real faith. But once you accept in your heart what Jesus did, did for you on the cross, you're different, you're born again, and you'll never be the same. Well, he hit the spot. I found it very interesting, and suddenly all my arguments seemed to evaporate. Over the next few days I was thinking about it, and then I decided to ask God if he was real and to help me understand and to know him if he was. Well, he did just that. One day I didn't know him, and then the next day, I did. Then things really began to change, and lots of God-inspired things have happened over the years. I've had many encounters with God, and been prompted by the Holy Spirit to do things which are totally out of my comfort zone. I'm going to give you a couple of examples now of how God has worked in my life. Right, it's 1999, some of you probably won't even born. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Asia, Cote d'Ivoire, or the Ivory Coast, do you know? West Africa, on the Millennium Bug business, do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Well, someone had to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the general manager's office, Pat, with him and his regional HR director, Melanie, and a guy from the Netherlands who I was travelling with. Case. We were discussing YTK plans for the region when a small, well dressed local man burst into the office and started shouting in French. Well, I knew a little French, but he was talking so fast that he was very agitated, I really didn't understand what he was saying. And then he took a gun from his seat pocket and started hitting Pat on the head with it. And when Melody tried to intervene, he hit her in the face a couple of times too. And suddenly, this became very serious. The guy was robbing the office, and Pat was trying to open a broken safe, but it wasn't a trading office, so there was no money in it anyway. However, Robert didn't believe that the safe was broken or empty, so he kept hitting Pat across the head. And then his accomplice came in. He was obviously the muscle, a big guy, no gun visible, but he didn't need one. He had a crazy look in his eyes. We were all told in French to lie on the ground and they took our watches, wallets and mobile phones. And bear in mind that the phones in those days were like bricks and they didn't take too many. At this point I thought, right, if he starts shooting, I'm going to have to jump in and try and get the gun. Sounds okay in theory, doesn't it? But then I imagined the newspaper headline, businessman from the UK shot dead in armed robbery in Abidjan. So I decided a better option would be to pray. Mm -hmm. I prayed and prayed that God would protect us all and that these guys would just leave without anyone getting hurt. Then the other people from the office were brought in and we were all told to lie on the floor and locked in the bathroom office, which was next to the main office. And then we waited to see what was going to happen next. I thought I'd pause for a little bit. 
We must have been there 15 minutes and no one moved a muscle. No one spoke. Really weird experience. It was just fear, really. Just then the cavalry came in. Three local security guys came in with guns to rescue us. Better late than never, we thought. They said the robbers were after money and were probably high on drugs. So if they had killed us, they probably wouldn't have even remembered it. Reassuring. That evening I was having a beer in the hotel bar with Case and we were discussing the events of the day, what you do? And Case asked me what I was thinking when the gun was being waved in the air and Pat was being hit. And I told him I wasn't thinking anything. I was too busy praying. Couldn't you hear me? So then we had a long discussion over many glad to be alive beers about life and faith, which we probably would never have otherwise. Case said that he went to a little church in Amsterdam the Sunday before our visit to Africa. And the vicar there was talking about a king inviting people to a wedding banquet for his son. But somebody wasn't dressed properly, so he was kicked out. He said he didn't normally go to church at all. But he didn't understand a word of what was being said. And so I said, by sheer coincidence, I went to a little church in Aylesbury that same Sunday. And we had exactly the same sermon. What are the chances of that? Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't understand it either. I, didn't. I, said, <laughs> I said, I said, of course I understood it. And I explained it to him. Uh, and he understood it. And he said, that's fantastic. I, when you explain it in that way, it's easy. A traumatic time for a while. But when I was praying so hard that God would protect us, I was trusting God to sort it out, the whole situation. And he did. Without that incident, we probably would never have had that conversation. So God uses all situations for the good. And you can find out more about the wedding feast in Matthew 22. Oh, well, by the way, after the incident, I called Leslie to let her know what happened. And as soon as I picked up the phone, she said, You wouldn't believe the day I've had. Believe <laughs> 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 <We'll> it. <laughs> now, it's October 2012. And I'm lying in bed. Some of you have heard the story, but others haven't. I'm lying in bed in Hammersmith Hospital waiting for open heart surgery. I needed a new aortic valve, so it's just a, a bit of internal plumbing, really. I'm pretty calm, I have a strong faith, and I knew God would look after me, either way. <coughs> I looked over at the bed opposite me, and there was this guy with no top on, shaven head, and just covered in tattoos. Tough looking guy. The sort of bloke you avoid on the underground, or anywhere else, come to that. He got up and started walking over to my bed. Okay, I thought. He can't do a lot of damage. He's ill after all. He's in hospital. But how ill is he? He stopped in my bed and he said, Do you know there's power in the name of Jesus? <laughs> well, as you can imagine, I was very relieved. And I said, Actually, I do. It turned out he was a street angel from Watford and was recovering from a quadruple bypass. And just in case you don't know, street angels help people who are vulnerable after the pubs and drugs close in most towns. <coughs> Especially young girls and make sure they get home safely. So I thought God sent an angel to reassure me that all would be well with the operation. How amazing is that? Thank you, God. That afternoon I had the operation and that evening I was lying in a high dependency bed with wires coming out of every, well nearly everywhere, mainly my leg. I was a bit groggy, well actually I felt like I'd been hit by a train, but gradually coming to. Several hours later, there were alarms going off everywhere, and the doctors and nurses rushing about, back and forth, to this guy in the bed beside me. Someone shouted, we need to get the crash team now. Lots of panic, but during all this chaos, I felt the need to pray for this guy. This guy who I've never seen or even met before. And when I say the need to pray, what I really mean is I was compelled to pray. I didn't have a choice. 
I had to pray to God to save him. So I raised my arm, and I'm still not sure how I did that, but I prayed like I'd never prayed before. It was almost pleading with God to save this man. And this happened, it continued for maybe 20, 25 minutes. Four times this man died. And at one point someone said, we need to get his next of kin, he's not going to make it. I continued praying and miraculously he survived. The medical team went away and things calmed down and we all went back to sleep. A few days later, this man was put in the bed opposite me in intensive care. And I asked him how he was feeling. He said he was okay, but he had a rough few days. One of his graphs had failed, and the doctors told him it was touch and go for a while. I told him what had happened, and that I was a Christian, and that I prayed to God to save his life. I'm not sure what he thought. He wasn't a Christian, but he thanked me, and he said he had the strangest out-of-body experience that evening. He could feel himself leaving his body and looking down and seeing himself and said a word which isn't repeatable and then he was pulled back into his body. His name was Paul and he, as I said he wasn't a Christian but he thanked me again and I told him not to waste the rest of his life because God had saved him for a purpose. Many months later I was thinking about what had happened that day and suddenly I realised that the street angel wasn't there that morning to reassure me, it wasn't all about me. He was there to tell me there was power in the name of Jesus, power to bring a man back from the dead with prayer. And I remember praying in the name of Jesus for Paul to be saved. Maybe Paul has become a Christian and gone on to do amazing things. Who knows? Carol, could we have the readings now, please? Thank you. I'll be back. <laughs> right, there's three readings, and I'm going to try and leave a ten second gap between each one, so it's not the first one. Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Matthew 8, 5 to 10. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and hear him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I tell this one, Go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and said to those following him, 
Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <You> no, <noticed>. just <laughs> I'm back. Right, a quick illustration to put everything into perspective. But I'm going to need some help from an assistant. There's <laughs>
So what's the difference between Christians and other Christians? Well, it's easy. Faith. Mm -hmm. We have the reading from Hebrews 11 there. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I believe that faith is probably the most important component of a Christian's life. We can't buy it, we can't sell it, we can't give it to our family or friends, even though many of us would love to be able to do that. It's a personal belief in God and an acceptance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. There are so many examples of people of faith in the Bible. By faith, Noah built an ark. People probably thought he was crazy. But he, was, he believed that it would rain because God told him to. By faith, Moses led the people out of, uh, of Israel, out of Egypt. How then do we get faith? Well, faith is not something we conjure up on our own. Nor is it something we're born with. Nor is it necessarily the result of studying the Bible. Ephesians 2 makes it very clear. Faith is a gift from God. Another gift along with grace. We need faith to please God. God tells us that it pleases him that we believe in him, even though we can't see him. You see, God is always actively pursuing us, inviting us into a relationship. And then it's up to us to respond, or not. The re that's the reason Christians are so desperate to tell everyone about God, so that they never be before it's too late. Mm. The great news is that faith is a free gift. All you have to do is repent of your sins and ask for the gift of faith. I know, it sounds too simple, doesn't it? But it's true. Imagine going through all of your life not knowing God, and then at the end of your life, you meet God, and he says to you, why didn't you seek me? I had all these amazing plans for your life. All you had to do was ask. I know, I really know, it's, believe me, it's a massive step for some people. Giving up what is essentially control of your life, surrendering to God, especially for those of us who are struggling with control freaks, or afraid of letting someone else guide us. Will it be boring being a Christian? Will all the fun be sucked out of life if I become a Christian? But remember, this is God we're talking about, who loves you more than anyone ever will. He only wants the very best for you. He would never harm you in any way. Trust him, even with your life. No, especially with your life. I was, as most people do in these sort of situations, going to say a short prayer of repentance to confirm your belief and acceptance of Jesus, and then ask you to say amen at the end to make it your prayer. But I have a better idea. I think. <laughs> I think it would be good for you to talk to God yourself. So, if you just close your eyes now, and if it helps, put your hands out in front of you. Just to receive God's Holy Spirit. In your mind, say whatever you want. If you want a relationship with Him, ask for it. If you want to say sorry for the sins you have committed, ask for forgiveness. If you want God to show you He is real, ask Him. Not from your head, but from your heart. Mm -hmm. Tell him that you want to live your life differently. His way, not your way. Tell him you surrender your life to him. But before you pray, 
Just think about who you're praying to. You're about to enter the throne room of Almighty God. With a hundred million angels singing God's praise. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Heaven is shaking with praise. And you have just entered. And now you're about to talk to God. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon us now, to anoint and bless us, to fill us, change us, mould us into the person you always intended us to be. Let's pray now, and when we finish, just say Amen and open your eyes. nothing that we have ever said, thought or done that is not covered by the blood of the Lamb. And all we have to do is thank him and to receive that forgiveness. That's amazing. That's faith, isn't it? Mm. It's faith not in ourselves, our own capabilities, it's not despair in ourselves and our own inabilities. It is entirely faith in him. Whether it's as tiny as a mustard seed or flowing like a roaring river in you right now makes not one age of difference. All we have to do is step up to receive the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. I like to think this is a moment of resetting for us when we have communion regularly together. It's a reminder, a remembering, a resetting of the direction of our lives. It's also a Eucharist in the Greek Eucharistia to give thanks, to say thank you. And I just want you to just that helps, just wriggle, get out of your seat a little bit and sit back down again. Just in a little huddle of twos and threes, I'd like you to ask God's Spirit to put something in your heart for which you are inordinately thankful and share it with someone around you. And you've only got three minutes to do that. So whatever it is, share it. Let's give thanks. Father, we thank you that you placed in our, in our hearts and minds that something that we could be thankful for. Mm. And we thank you for that. Um, some of us may have struggled longer than others, but we thank you that we've had conversation, that we've had this fellowship together, that we've had this time of reflection and sharing. Above all else, we thank you for 
for your sharing of yourself in Jesus Christ our Saviour. We thank you for the good news. The good news that calls us, shepherds us, seeks us and brings us to your table as welcome guests. And so we thank you and we make our communion together. Amen. So we pray, and obviously I will say the words in the light of it, and if you respond with the words in the bold time, you make the words your own. Jesus, in obedience and faith, we remember how you made for us a new promise with God. On the night before you died, at table with your friends, you blessed and shared bread and wine, declaring them to be your body broken for us and your blood by which our sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that by your life, death and resurrection, we have become your body, a people of faith, called to draw others into the family of heaven. And again, I invite you to just put out your hands as a symbol of receptivity. Jesus, we receive anew your forgiveness and mercy in this foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for us and all your people. As we prepare to eat and drink with you, send your Holy Spirit upon us. Increase our faith in your prayer. Spirit says, Come. Bend the knee before the throne of God. Come. Kneel before the cross of Christ. Come. Repent and receive that rivers of life may flow from you into the world that Jesus loves. So I ask that you come as a sign and a symbol of the bending of the knee, the bowing of the head, the receiving of the Lordship of Christ over your life. All who seek the Lord Jesus are welcome at his table. Come, receive in faith. You to come if you're able. If you're not, we will come to you after. So, Jesus, we thank you for our salvation, for communion with you and with each other, and for the promise of heaven. For a moment there, <laughs> it's, like, it's the trumpet of the Lord. <laughs> yes, you can come back in. Bless you. Has, has Jesse had communion? Jesse's had communion. They've just taken communion to Carol in Yes, Carl. yes. I, I just love that. <laughs> I love it. Just got that vision of that rope snaking out through that door. <laughs> And aren't we, aren't we glad to be part of that eternity? It's just a daggering image to hold in our minds. Thank you. And we say thank you for our salvation and our communion with God. 
And we say thank you for the promise of heaven. It begins the moment that we say yes to Jesus, that's it. And that eternity of joy and peace, just unfathomable to our earthbound minds, but that's what we are part of. Isn't that an amazing thing? Yes, it is. So let's pray this prayer. May your spirit so fill us with your grace that we may go from here renewed in faith to serve and honour you in the world which you love. Amen. Amen.